to present in, but let's get started. So welcome everyone. Um, this is our expert panel slash webinar on pricing. Um, and specifically, we actually are thinking about what are all the challenges of competitor pricing, pricing research, and what are some of the myths around that? Um, and really, this is much more of an interactive panel type of discussion. Uh, we'll get to some of the rules and, and what we'll talk about in, the, in a second. Um, before we begin, don't worry, we are going to be sending you the recording of this. Uh, we're not going to have a whole lot of slides. We're only about 65 slides to go through. Um, but really, the floor is completely open. That's why I'm asking everyone to type in the chat where you're coming from, because really, this is where we want to hear from you. If you have questions, you have comments, fire them away into chat, and then I will pick them up as we go. So today, we have a couple of experts joining us um, in talking about pricing, pricing research. Um, I've done a little bit of pricing research, but really, these are the folks who are doing it and have done it for a lot of years. Um, so April, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks for having me, Vincent. And this is a, a fun topic. Uh, I'm, I can tell by all the people that you have attending that there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, a little bit about me before we jump into pricing. Uh, I am a certified competitive intelligence professional. I specialize in primary research. So I spend a lot of my time talking with people about their experience in the market or with certain products and really just work hard to answer those key intelligence questions that take companies from indecision or lack of strategy into a place where they can make some have some real momentum. So that's what I love about my job. Brady? Hey guys, uh, Brady Jensen here. I'm the principal of a um, consultancy. We focus on product marketing research and strategy. As part of that, we do a, a lot of competitive intelligence work as well, although I don't actually advertise it. Um, we focus a lot on helping organizations that need to understand what they don't know about what's outside their building a whole lot better so they can make better strategic decisions around their go-to-market and how they approach uh, winning in the market. Philippe, over to you. Hey. Hey everybody, I'm Philippe Boutros. I'm Chief of Staff at Cascade Insights. So we're a 25 person company. Started off with our roots just doing competitive intelligence. So a lot of people asking us for pricing research. Now we've grown to do a lot of market research, marketing services, things like that, only for B2B technology companies. But um, people still ask us about pricing research all the time and it, it makes sense. So super excited to talk about this. Great, thanks for being here. Oh, no. Skip one slide. So a couple of things we're going to cover. Um, one of the things that I think we all are uh, going to be chatting a lot about is like, how do we go about setting expectations for the types of repressing research that's possible that should be done? Um, also knowing about the different aspects of pricing and in pricing research and what's important to answer different types of questions. And really what we want to, to get from you know, uh, April with Philippe and Brady is how do you go about actually doing pricing research and some real life examples and stories um, that, that they can share with the folks. So let's begin with that elephant in the room. Secret shopping. <laughs> this is a, a question, a comment, a request that comes to even us a lot. Um, is there someone you can actually recommend for uh, to, to help us do a secret shopping exercise on a competition? What are your thoughts on that? Panel, Philippe, Brady, April? Who wants to go first? With I'll Nancy, go first. Probably all unless, to give. Okay. Unless you'd like to, Philippe, I'll go first. Um, my, my perspective on secret shopping is it's a ethics aside, it's a great way to have one data point that can only be extrapolated to one data point. Um, sales folks, you know, I've been in product marketing for a long time. I was also a seller for a long time. And I know there's a big difference between the go-to-market that's put out by the organization and the go-to-market of each individual rep as they decide what to keep and what to throw out and how to go about uh, pursuing a deal. So everything from how they position 
to whether or not their slides have a bunch of homemade things with, you know, Dukes of Hazard imagery in them, uh, to how they're going to price their deal is entirely uh, subjective to that one individual. So to me, I, I think it's a lot more important to me to think about how can I gather data points that don't share where one deal landed or where one uh, deal settled on a cost perspective um, and uh, pay more attention to how that's happened across a bunch of different organizations so that you can get a sense of not you know how well you as a secret shopper negotiated price or what the price was when it came to you know rack rate um, but get it uh, get us get your hands around the strategy of that uh, competitor how they price how they think about those things yeah I think those are Felipe I think you said um, go ahead somebody start because I think you're we're all going to say something similar and so I agree with what you said Brady and I think that a lot of our conversation will be around the broader um, kind of competitive picture um, and not just a price on a spreadsheet. Um, I will touch on the ethics just to contribute to this part of the conversation. Uh, our policy is that we never misrepresent who we are to the people that we're talking with. And so um, that doesn't mean that you can't talk to people about pricing. Um, but we won't build an elaborate story around the company, the pretend company we're from and a pretend set of requirements, and then ask somebody to invest a whole bunch of time in developing a proposal and give us a price and then just ghost them. So we are sometimes intentionally vague about who we are. Sometimes we specifically say we can't tell them who we're working for, what we're doing, but we don't, um, you know, create false identities and false personas in order to get at the work. So that I'll just contribute that little bit about um, kind of an ethical line where I'm willing to cross. Totally. Yeah, we, we run much the same way, April and Brady. Um, we don't take on secret shopping projects. One thing I'll add, um, I agree with everything that's been said. One thing I'll add is that um, we, we don't like scoping out projects where the outcome is totally non-deterministic. Like we like to be able to say, we're going to work with you and get to an outcome. And one thing that worries me, especially with secret shopping, ethics aside, which is a fun sentence to say, um, <laughs> is that you, 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 you very well may end up at the end at a situation where um, you're getting close to getting pricing, you're getting a proposal. So we don't get this far, but you're, getting, you're about to get a proposal and you have to sign some sort of document from them um, to, to get that. So what we see often in like end user license agreements or things like that, even for a demo, would be something along the lines of, um, this cannot be used for competitive benchmarking or competitive purposes. And the second you sign that, you can't as a consultant share those with your client anymore. So um, in addition to just getting one data point, you might not even be able to share that data point. That, that's a great point. That's a great point. I think that's a great segue to a related question. And then we'll come back to ethics afterwards, I uh, promise you. When, when it comes to secret shopping, right, like that, that initial ask, when do they, when do clients actually come to you? Like for what purpose, what are they trying to solve for? Um, and when they are coming to you for these pricing research or secret shopping exercises, what are they really asking for you to look for? I'll go first on this one. Um, I, I think it makes a ton of sense that it's like one of the pricing is, even if the project isn't just about pricing, pricing being one of the asks, from a competitive lead, it makes a ton of sense. You're you're sitting somewhere in the, in the middle of your organization where you have sales making, like as a competitive lead, you have sales asking you, hey, we wanna figure out exactly how they're pricing stuff so we can better pitch against them. Among other asks, you have corporate strategy trying to figure out how we're gonna price things to be, to sort of grow, how should we forecast things? Um, so it makes a lot of sense that you, you, you as a competitive lead get all these requests and think, I'm gonna go ask vendors, hey, help us figure out pricing as a part of that. Um, so I think when they first get on the call, I think there's some sort of initial expectation like, hey, could you get us, could you help us basically deconstruct their, their CPQ system, their configure price quote system. And at some point during that conversation, I think they realize not only is that not possible or not, not ethical or not you know, pra practical, it's also maybe not the best thing for us. There's maybe a better outcome we can get to. I'm guessing we'll end up talking a bit more about that too. Yeah, when we, we get those requests, um, just kind of use case wise, we see that a lot when people, when companies are launching new products or significant iterations of their product and aren't exactly sure where to price it. Um, 
sometimes when they're getting beat up on an existing product by a competitor and their salespeople don't know how to battle the, the low price message. And also there's some of those corporate drivers like uh, it's time to you know, consider price increases. We're working on planning or forecasting. We're looking closer at our competitive landscape. So those are the instances. And Philippe, to your point, it, it makes sense that pricing is one of the asks in there. Uh, and I think, you know, we'll talk further about the direction that we give in those instances in some cases. But if, you know, one of the things that we talk about is if, if price is your sole data point, then the natural strategy is to compete on price, the number, you know, the, you're selling it for 10, I'll sell it for 999. Um, and I, I don't think most people come with us, come to us asking for pricing with the intention to run that strategy. So we talk to them more about, you know, are you looking for tools to combat somebody else's low price message and how you differentiate and what, you know, what clients, um, or customers might uh, equate with value. And, and so we kind of broaden the conversation at that point. But to Philippe's point, it makes perfect sense that people are asking for it. We just think it's a bigger question. Brady, your I, I really liked how uh, April specifically made mention about oftentimes it's because they're being outpositioned, right? They think it's a they think it's a price question where really they need to understand, how are they talking about me, right? How can I talk about myself in a way that allows me flexibility to charge on my value delivery versus just a straight cost play? You know, I most of my clients are in uh, in B two B enterprise software. Um, they oftentimes think they want a data point, but if I gave them one, they wouldn't know what to do with it, right? They want to compare and contrast. I understand the the interest in trying to benchmark, right? The same way as, as HR departments are constantly looking to see, are they above market? Are they below market? Where do they fit in their compensation? I think the same thing is helpful to understand, you know, where do I fit relative to my competitors? But it's really, you know, the, what they're not satisfied if you give them a number, they're satisfied if you give them a way to understand where they sit relative to others. And I think Philippe and, and uh, Brady, you brought up a great point. Like the question on pricing is one of the aspects of competitive research. I think what I'm really curious about is how often do clients come to you with initially with a pricing ask? I think it's probably about one with pricing as the sole thing they're asking for. Um, and I should I should caveat, we don't we don't have the word pricing on our site in any sort of, we don't say we do pricing research is one of the things. We say we do competitive intelligence. There's probably other firms out there that say they do pricing. Um, we try to steer away from it in our messaging. I would say probably one out of eight or one out of 10 competitive intelligence leads is coming and saying, either pricing is the main ask or is like a big part of what they're trying to figure out. And there are, um, I, I think there's a little bit of nuance to that too. I think some of the time, May, probably most of the time it's figuring out how they stack how they stack up relative to the competitor in a deal so like their sales team wants to know for this given type of client or for this given type of service that we're competing on um, are we more expensive less or about the same um, sometimes it's figuring out pricing and Brady you'll run into this too with your your you must see this with your software clients too where they're trying to figure out are they are they just trying to buy market share right so it's not even like what is the specific pricing amount but is it are they just discounting like crazy, not trying to make money on it and just trying to like, buy as much of the market as they can? Um, and that's always, that's much more interesting, frankly, than like figuring out exactly what the dollars and cents are of every like per user pricing or something like that. April, I think I see you itching to say something. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, if they're buying market share, the next follow-up question is how long can they do that for? And when should we be ready to pounce? And so there's a lot of really good questions that come out of some of that early research uh, as you're learning. So um, Vincent, in response to your question, I think it's not uncommon to get requests from clients that are very um, straightforward and sometimes numeric in value. Uh, I think, Brady, you might have touched on this idea that, um, you know, I'd love to have something that I can, you know, touch and feel and a metric that I, you know, can 
quickly understand and quickly share. Uh, and we, we see it on market sizing a lot of times too. Like I want a very specific market size for this very niche product for this very specific segment. Um, and it's going to cost a million dollars to get there. And then what are you going to do with it? And so I think it's just a great, I, when the requests come in, I think it's just a great way to start a broader conversation. And sometimes just that conversation in itself adds so much value to the discussion, um, you know, that that in itself could be a project deliverable is let me help you think about pricing in a different way, or let me help you think about these key intelligence questions in a different way. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of questions that are actually coming in the Q&A in the chat. Um, first one, I think from Michael Morgan, and, and this leads actually into the next conversation we want to have. The question is, do you believe or agree that capturing perfect details of pricing and packaging is a waste of time? And that knowing the general ballpark pricing and discounting behavior is more useful for strategic decisions? I'll, I'll jump I in there. That question. I, I actually think the chances that you're going to get that level of detail and not be um, in possession of confidential information is very low. Um, so I think it's a balance between the two, right? You think you always need more. I'm always of the perspective that you can get 90 to 95% of the way there ethically and legally. And the other 5%, um, most times you wouldn't really know what to do to execute based on what you've got. So my perspective is yes, more detail can be better, but frankly, it can uh, put you in a, in a risky position. And frankly, there is, um, there is a point of diminishing returns where you're no longer getting information that would really help you make a strategic decision more than just make you feel more certain about what you know. Yeah, I totally agree. One of our one of our clients, this is like a public thing about Amazon, so I can say it, but um, they, they have an internal saying that it's better to make a, a somewhat wrong or mostly right decision with 70% of the information than wait to get 100% of the information and make like the perfect decision. Because by the time by the time you've invested all that money and time, what have they been doing for the, the three months that you spent hiring vendors to secret shop 45 times? They've done stuff while you've been waiting. Well, let's talk about that. Let's let's talk about the different aspects of pricing. Um, aside from rack rate and, and discounting practices, what else is out there? What else is important? I'm gonna I'll make a general comment about that. And it kind of ties to that question a little bit too. So I think the ask is often more traditional pricing information like price, pricing model, um, you know, traditional discounted rates. Um, and uh, I, there is value in gathering that information that's publicly available. Uh, one of the things that I think differentiates, you know, those who are creating strategy is collecting information that isn't publicly available. So spending all of your time gathering pricing from uh, various websites and compiling them into a spreadsheet um, and comparing them to products and features um, may be necessary, um, definitely has some value. But if you stop there, you've done everything that your competitor could have also done pretty easily. So relying on publicly available information won't differentiate your, your Intel-based strategy in any way if you don't continue down the path to understand pricing in a different way. And I, I'll let Philippe and Brady speak a little bit about uh, you know, all the different ways that you can look at pricing. But I think it's just important to note that um, if you stop where everyone else could have easily stopped, you're not going to build your strategy on anything different than anyone else. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, one, so a couple other aspects to pricing that we that we think about. So like we, you, Vincent, you brought up discounting, right? I, I would say within discounting, there's are there types of clients where the competitor has a larger propensity to discount? Because that, that not only lets your sales team know, hey, you're going up against this, they, they care a lot about pharma, you're going up against a pharma client, you should think about being more aggressive. It also lets you know strategically what the company's thinking about because for them to decide, we're going to discount more in a certain area that has to come down from on high, and that's probably a sign of something else happening in the works. Um, 
I would also say something that doesn't get mentioned enough that I think should come to mind with pricing is the terms and conditions associated with the deal, right? I talked earlier about how some EULAs might have language in there that doesn't let you uh, use the information competitively, and that's one thing. Um, from the client's perspective, we'll sometimes see deals that have, um, we'll sometimes hear about how competitors will build into their deals something along the lines of, um, hey, if you cancel early, there's this charge associated with it, or um, you have to buy this amount of extra implementation costs or X or Y or Z. You have to do implementation through this partner in particular. Um, so even though directly you might be at the same pricing level or your competitor might be cheaper, knowing how they're structuring the engagement, which is a bit of a meta comment on pricing in general, is super valuable to teams, we find. Pretty anything to add? Um, I think they touched on the on the big stuff, but I do think, you know, every every company that's that's uh, sophisticated has people who are focused on how to price their own product, right? And and they have a strategy, right? And understanding that as much as you can is way more important. You know, everything down to, uh, like Felipe said, like. Is there are there onerous like contracting uh, provisions, right? Um, are there, you know, can you can a, can seats be added and taken away, right? Or is it only go up and never down? Um, contract duration, uh, all those sorts of things are helpful for you to understand how they think about themselves. Um, I will say, you know, April, I totally agree with you. What I have found, though, is there are some organizations that don't even do the minimal, I right? Mean, yeah. And so there are there are organizations out there where maybe sales is doing their own CI research or whatever, um, and it's just really poorly uh, organized anyway. So even getting to the point where you're getting publicly available information is a great start. Obviously, uh, you you will oftentimes get to parity with organizations that way, and then you need to take that next step. Uh, but in some cases that may uh, get you a long way down the road, just because, you know, depending on the organization, there are some that have a very strong focus that, Hey, we're only going to, you know, die by suicide. We will, you know, we don't worry about competition. You know, there are organizations out there that almost like shy away from it, thinking that competition doesn't matter. Um, and there are, are places that are super uh, competitive. I think about, you know, I, I worked at one point for one of the very early CI software companies no longer in existence. Um, and one of the clients was, uh, was Altria, right? So cigarettes and they had like hundreds of people on the street checking, uh, individual displays to find out how much, uh, competing cigarette prices were right across all sorts of, uh, cities across the country and got super granular. I don't work very much in that world. So to me, um, pricing is more of an exercise of larger deal sizes and, and uh, less data points. But um, the level of sophistication, obviously, if you're on this call, the chances are you probably are more focused on this and it can be a, a real competitive advantage as you think about how you go about winning in the market. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you're all touching on uh, something that this new question actually came in um, that's related to, which is to what extent does competitive pricing include total cost of ownership? That is the initial cost upfront might be low, but then the upkeep is high. Is it really best to compare against uh, TCO or other aspects of pricing? From my perspective, there's... Um you you learn how important which one is along the way right if you're in the software game and you're competing against open source right for instance like all of a sudden tco is all that matters right or almost all that matters so i think uh, i hate to give the depends answer but um if i could have my way you'd probably have both and you un and understanding those and being able to communicate them to the market is is uh, important yeah. yeah, and I could see a scenario where while it's important to understand total cost of ownership, um, it's also important to know what your salespeople are coming up against when they're out there. So while we might respond with total cost of ownership from a sales perspective, we should know that coming at our salespeople is some 
you know, super low price that doesn't consider that, which may or may not be compelling to the audience. And so it does help them, while maybe not the important number and the number we think that the prospective customer should be considering, um, it does help us educate our salespeople as to what they might encounter and how to, re you know, refute that. Totally. Um, I would, I think, so when you're, especially for larger deals, um, if you're if you're one of the sellers, so if you're a stakeholder of one of the competitive leads that's engaging with us, um, you you especially in larger deals are going to end up at some point being evaluated. So if you're lucky enough to get through the long list and lucky enough to make through the demo, and it's just finally come down to I've submitted you to procurement along with the competition, and they're guiding this last bit of the decision, and it's that awful last negotiating bit with procurement where they don't know if they're buying nails or screws or light bulbs or enterprise software it's all the same to them they're putting you in a spreadsheet right next to the competition and they're not just <clears throat> their their job ideally is actually to look at tco right their job ideally is to be able to say i have captured all the different cost elements of this and that's how i drive this decision so um the more the more you as a competitive lead can actually think about competitor pricing through the lens of tco and really get all the different knobs and whistles. You're not you're not only going to be more successful when you get to the procurement phase, you're also arming your sales team with the ability to go in the conversation and say, sure, I know competitor X might seem cheaper, but here's all the ways in which that's gonna add up. It's, it's a more consultative sale and it's more, you're building trust with the client and you're kind of helping yourself a lot when you get to the last phase too. So I'd really lean on the TCO side when possible. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions here around like, how do you go about doing pricing in an ethical way? But before we actually get there, let's talk about ethics. Um, we all talked about secret shopping as a big no-no uh, and, and not to represent ourselves in, in these type of exercises. Why is it? How do you approach that in terms of, in terms of walking a client off the ledge? Brady, I know you have a really great story to share. Let's start there. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, there, there's always uh, a middle ground, I think, between um, what clients might think they want and the sum of my risk tolerance and their risk tolerance, right? Um, there's There's clients who think they want the price book, right? I'll give you an example. I was working for a company and the price book of our major competitor. And at the time it was a hot market, Microsoft, Salesforce, SAP, every big technology company was in the game. And our biggest competitor, one of their price book was mailed to me with no return address. I had no idea who it came from. I didn't know what to do with it, right? Um, and my first stop was to the general counsel to say, what should I do with this, right? And um, the answer was to shred it, don't even look at it, which I did. It wasn't a few months later that there was a lawsuit. Um, they were subpoenaed, the book, the kimono was thrown wide open. And um, if we were to have had that, there was a huge risk to the organization, specifically in the US around antitrust. Um, if your organization makes a pricing move uh, where they become more expensive because they find out a competitor was expensive, um, that can open you up to all sorts of legal liability that have not, has nothing to do with competitive intelligence per se, but opens you up to risk of appearing to collude um, and all sorts of things that would land you in hot water with the federal government. Um, I was, you know, a good soldier and, and did exactly what I knew I should, which was ask the attorneys, shred the thing, not until after the fact when they came storming down my door to find out if I had actually done it, they had, as they had said, and told me all the background, did I realize I'm no attorney. Uh, but there is there are real risks to operating in the gray area uh, around confidential information, around antitrust, um, and uh, it, I, I seek out clients that understand that I'm going to stick by a set of ethics and that that's exactly how they would play it because otherwise there will be a constant friction of, of expectation handling of trying to find out 
you know, how do I manage a client who wants me to push boundaries that I can't ethically push or legally push? Um, there are industries, pharma, et cetera, that you may see even more uh, it, things, or at least I hear stories of the dumpster diving and that sort of thing that, uh, um, that I don't do. So it, to me, it's all about setting a boundary, helping the organization understand that risk that they take on if they choose to pursue different paths. Philippe, what's your talk in terms of handling that, that request? I, for shopping? I also just have to say that antitrust story is so interesting. It's so good. Um, that, that has, that's going to stick in my brain for a long time. It's a really good example. Um, so we, we, I am guessing Brady and April, you're both the same, but like we stick to the skip code of ethics, right? We don't misrepresent ourselves. It's not, Brady made an excellent point earlier where when you're secret shopping, you're only getting one piece of information. Um, here's how we go about collecting this information ethically, right? So we, we have two, two general sources for this. We have what we can find through desk research or what we call OSINT, open source intelligence. And then we have what we can get through primary intelligence, which is going and talking to people directly. Um, what you, I, I, I try to never scope a project only around the secondary piece, because like we said earlier, what you can find uh, online is totally non-deterministic, right? You don't know what's gonna be out there. Um, I, I will, um, you will every now and then find something interesting. So I do, I do want to talk a bit later about the primary intelligence piece, but you will sometimes find interesting things with desk research. So one tip for those of you in the chat who are saying, what's an actual way that I can go find competitor pricing sometimes. Um, you, if you, so we used to publish a book called Going Beyond Google, and we did, we did six editions of it. Um, it's an ebook. It's somewhere around online. If you can find it and finding it is a good test of your Googling skills. Um, and in there, you had a bunch of, uh, we had a bunch of tips around how to like sort of improve your Google too. One thing in particular that was not in the book that I discovered recently, um, if you site search, so sites colon cdn2.hubspot.net, and I'm happy to share this with anyone else after the call, um, and look, just Google stuff, Google like your competitor name and pricing and stuff like that. Obviously, if something says confidential, don't use that. Obviously, if something seems like it shouldn't be there, don't, don't use that. But um, there's a lot of information on there. And the, the only reason why I'm saying this here and not thinking this is unethical, I filed that as a bug bounty to HubSpot two years ago. And I said, hey, I randomly came across this page that seems to have a lot of material that I'm guessing shouldn't be, should, shouldn't be out there. And HubSpot responded to me by saying, no, 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 that's not a bug. That's a feature. So take advantage of that. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I uh, <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Philippe. I, I didn't know that, and I'm going to be hitting you up myself after this call. <laughs> um, I will say another way, you know, when we're, when I'm doing secondary, um, there's a lot of municipalities, states, any government organization most likely has a legal obligation to publish things around their RFP responses, those sorts of things. Though I found those to be super helpful if you're doing desk research to understand um, how that's happening. State of Texas in particular has, has seemed to bear a lot of fruit. Um, if you sell to the state of Texas, there's probably a video of you pitching them uh, somewhere online. So, um, that's a great option as well, I think. I think when we um, start on any project, um, pricing included, we kind of lay out all kinds of different approaches. So we'll do primary and secondary approaches. And we take a look at those approaches and think about which ones are really easy. We, we kind of evaluate each approach and say, um, what's the level of difficulty and what's the likelihood it's gonna bear fruit? And so I'll throw out some of those that are really easy and maybe won't always bear fruit, but take five minutes. And so we start there anyways. That's just kind of a, we might as well check these quick, easy sources. Um, Philippe, you just gave us a new one. Um, also, um, and this is super simple, but we always go to an advanced search in Google and look for PDFs um, with some keywords in it. And you never know who might have their pricing sitting out there in some sort of PDF, or you know, we'll do the same with an Excel document. Um, that particularly gets a little bit more fruitful when you go down through um, 
kind of the sales channels a little bit. So if a manufacturer or um, you know a brand owner does business through distributors who do business through dealers who do business through you know third party you know partners um, somewhere along the line sometimes people share pricing as part of their business model that might not be part of the business model of you know the the manufacturer brand owner and so kind of following the path through the distribution channel is helpful um, and then another one of those kind of low-hanging fruit um, tactics that we use for secondary is asking for public pricing on forums. So we're not asking anyone to provide us with pricing that isn't publicly available. We're just asking for help finding it. Uh, and sometimes as good as we are at secondary research, sometimes somebody just knows where it happens to exist. Uh, and so those are just a few of those um, low effort approaches that we don't count on to bring us the answer. We really count on primary research. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more, Vincent. But um, we kind of start with some of that secondary research because it doesn't take a whole lot of time and it may or may not bear fruit. So we're ruling those out as potential um, resources. And, and something related to what you said, April, in terms of Googling for the PDFs. Similarly, you can actually do the same thing for PowerPoint decks, right? That also shows yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, the good uh, pitch text will have a confidentiality statement at, at the bottom of it, but I've seen examples from my competition before where, oh, it was actually sitting in a uh, S3 bucket and there's no statement in there that I can actually go about using. <laughs> Let's talk about primary for a second. Um, so Mike had a question in here about all of us have actually said about the value of secret shopping as being uh, limited in terms of being able to collect competitive info. Do you see more value in di capturing direct uh, competitive information from the customer or from prospects? I'll start on that one. I think uh, you know, we spend most of our time doing primary research. And so, you know, you could say I have a bias, but I think again, we do that work because we know that that's where you, the unique insights come from. But so there, so when you're doing primary research, um, a, a couple things, you sometimes it's hard to get pricing information out of people. So there's some tips and tricks and I'll let everybody else contribute to those too, but there's some tips and tricks in getting pricing information out of people when you're in the midst of an in-depth interview. Um, to name one, you know, they'll say they can't recall pricing and you might say, um, is it, you know, more than $100 or less than $100. You know, you kind of just start guiding them in through a funnel until you get them to recall what the actual pricing is. But the other, and so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna set that aside for a minute because I'm sure we have all kinds of tips and tricks on getting people to talk about pricing. Um, but the other thing that happens in primary research is you get to broaden the conversation. And so, um, for example, we're, we're researching pricing and we're making an assumption um, to some extent that pricing is really important to the buyers. But what if cost is seventh on their list of things that they care about? So when you, when you broaden the scope of the project and do a lot of the work through primary research, you really get to know um, what part of the, how important is pricing in the conversation? And if it's if not pricing, what else is important? And so then you combat competitor pricing and then shift the conversation to what buyers really care about. And so primary research not only can help you get to pricing, but it also can, uh, and a lot of times more importantly, broaden the conversation of what really is important to the buyer. Totally, I, I cannot echo that enough. I think about if, uh, if we're interviewing, so not just customers to Mike, to Mike's question, but also former sellers or partners, right? So if you're interviewing a former seller, and the former seller says, yes, we were always cheaper and we would hammer that in in every conversation. Now you know what they're saying in the deal. If a partner says, uh, like a reseller says, they used to incentivize us more and now that's gotten like more and more limited over time. Now you have a sense for sort of how they're thinking about their margins a bit. Um, even like my earlier point about uh, the, the conditions of an agreement, if a customer says, yeah, we, we would at the renewal, we'd always get screwed over. That's why we stopped renewing with insert large technology company. Um, those are all findings that are really actionable by sales in the conversations that don't necessarily affect your bottom line, right? You can, you can keep your pricing the same, but the sellers can use those when they're, when they're sort of trying to deposition the competition. 
And I think related to this question, um, in, in terms of pricing and, and primary research strategies, probably for more for Brady, how do you go about handling information during research when you get information that you're not supposed to get? Uh, for example, a competitor sales rep sends a price list to a customer. How would you go about handling that type of situation? Well, I, I make my clients aware of what I encounter, but I make it very clear up front with them what won't reach them for their own good, right? There's a firewall between me. I feel like it's not just my ethical duty, but it's actually my legal duty to make sure that they don't get exposure just because you've encountered something that uh, that could provide them that exposure. So it's not an... It's not me telling them, hey, here it is. You let me know if you should have it. But hey, we've, we have, uh, and to April's point, it's also sort of like I lay out for them the pathways we could get information. And if we end up in a pathway where we're getting information that would be great for them to know, but would put them in any, any legal risk, I'll tell them we, we, we went down that path we found stuff we can't share. We can go down that path again and, and see if we can find information we can share. Um, but uh, the last thing I want to do is put them at any risk. And frankly, a big part of that to me is really about focusing the primary in areas where I know that the, the risk is lower. So there are very few competitive intelligence engagements. And maybe I'm lucky in the sense that I do positioning, I do messaging, I do all these other things. Um, on top of that, but there are very few engagements where I will say, I will go do pricing for you, right? It's, it's, let's figure out a program where that information flows, right? Win loss uh, programs are another thing that's really well suited for an external third party, because you're going to get so much richer information about what happened. And these people are oftentimes very willing to share about what they found. Right. Or I'm, ha or I have all sorts of ways to find, maybe it's not win loss, but to find someone who recently evaluated your competitor who wasn't even evaluating you, but is happy to share with me about what they learned, what they heard, how it was positioned, including how pricing was positioned to them in a less, um, uh, risky environment. Um, so that's my preference is to not, uh, is to seek those avenues that I know are really fruitful and the, and the chance to take that shot is high, uh, and the, and the risk is a little, uh, or is much lower. Um, and I think Felipe touched on this, but there's also, um, the question of, okay, so you've got, you want pricing, Maybe it wasn't, maybe it's the April, but in any case, you, you want pricing, but if I find someone who can tell me about pricing, they can tell me about a whole lot more, right? So what are the things that we don't know? You know, we work in a world of key intelligence questions, key intelligence topics, right? And every time they come to me and say, I want pricing, I say, well, what else don't you know, right? Because if I can find the person who can tell me about pricing, they can tell me about their go-to-market. They can tell me about... Uh, the product, they can tell me about how they're positioning, all these sorts of things that you would miss out on if, you, if you're if you really myopic about just the pricing uh, component. Yeah, Brady, I'm glad you went there because as you were talking, I was thinking in a similar direction. And I think one of the most valuable things that we do as practitioners, and one of the things that you may take on or currently do in your roles as, you know, uh, as in your company is helping determine what the right key intelligence questions are. So if somebody in your organization comes to you and says, um, I need pricing, um, we always deconstruct that and say, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and what do you need to know in order to make that decision or develop that strategy? Um, and that always changes the, the question from, what is the competitor's pricing to something bigger? And then that scopes the project. And Brady, as you're suggesting, as we're talking to people and maybe we're wanting to know more about the you know, buying criteria is the key intelligence question rather than just pricing. Um, we may, we're gonna learn about pricing, but we're also gonna learn about how important pricing is to the conversation when they're making a decision and how they define value and 
you know, total cost of ownership and all of those other kind of bigger questions. And so I think as practitioners, one of our main responsibilities is to help develop key intelligence questions that will drive action. And sometimes that could be what is the competitor's price, but more often it's a bigger question. I would say, you know, when, whenever I talk to, especially if the competitive intelligence work is focused heavily on the sales team, having been a seller for a long time, I've learned that salespeople really want to know two things. What do I do? What do I say? Right. And a number on a piece of paper isn't going to tell them that, right. Providing, providing prescriptive guidance on what they should do with that information makes all the difference in the world when it comes to them putting down their Google search uh, and relying on really good internal information that frankly de-risks everything for everyone because a good CI team is going to make sure that sales shines, that they've got the most up-to-date information, that they're not, you know, hawking talking points from two years ago that are completely irrelevant today. That's a great point. I actually love what you said about needing to put in the guidance. That's more, going to be most helpful for sellers. It's probably something that we'll actually uh, extract out from this bit of webinar and use a little snippet in the future. Uh, there's a question here for April, and I think this is open to both Philippe and, and Brady as well. So what types of primary research process did you stand up first? Uh, was it a win-loss interview or consumer, customer, user type of research? Um, what are you saying? Which one we would suggest first? I think that's what the question is. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that depends on the key intelligence question. Um, uh, so you said win loss, which I would, um, I'm, I'm suggesting that that would be with a prospect or a customer. And then what was the other category, Vincent? Uh, win loss. And then what was the other category, Vincent? I'm, sorry, I'm not seeing the question on my screen. The other question was uh, consumer customer slash user research. Ah, uh, um, yeah, it definitely depends on the key intelligence question. I think um, the, I'm gonna have the other panelists weigh in on this, but as I think about this off the cuff, um, you're gonna get different perspectives from let's say the consumers are downstream a little while, a little ways. And so you're gonna get things that people care about, um, your direct customers care about. So Philippe, you might have mentioned earlier um, uh, like incentives or rebates or something to a third party seller. Um, so if you're doing a win loss and your customers are third party sellers who then go on and sell to consumers, you're gonna learn that kind of information. Um, you may also gather perspective from that level um, about what they know about their customers. When you reach directly to end users or end customers, you're gonna get a different perspective um, and it'll be different key intelligence questions. Uh, you may choose to talk to those people, not just about the price they're willing to pay and what's important to them, but um, whether or not their third party sellers are servicing them well and what value do they get out of the third party sellers and why are they willing to um, pay a third party seller a margin to be part of the transaction. And so it's just very different key intelligence questions, I think, but both valuable depending on what you're trying to achieve. I would add that there, I do a lot of work with digital health, health tech companies. Um, a lot of the sales don't necessarily go through a reseller, but go through a consultant who is also taking a piece. Um, understanding those agreements and what goes into a final cost uh, that the buyer is almost certainly not aware of can be super helpful. You know, someone, a consultant that's really great at adding a 50% margin um, that comes directly out of the ability of that competitor to put that money into R&D and put that money into customer success and put that money in all those other reasons that they could spend the money. So I do think all the way down the value chain is important to inspect because you do, you can understand. And frankly, if I'm going to go position, it's a whole lot better for me to explain that story to a, to a prospect than their 10 cents more per uh, seat per month, right? Yeah, and the last thing I'd add to that is XLers. 
I would go find competitor accelerators and interview them, especially people who left just a few months ago, because a customer can speak to the deal they were in and partners can speak to the deals they've supported and accelerators can speak to the dozens or hundreds of deals that they were part of, hopefully. I would add one thing to that, um, you know, that I've found particularly helpful recently and it's uh, in my line of work, there's a lot of proposal writers. And if there's one person who knows all the answers, it seems to be the person who's constantly writing RFP responses. So Brady, you touch on something very interesting. Um, in different industries, there are different practices that, that pricing resources really need to think about and look at. Um, let's start there. The healthcare, health tech, you talked about that. Um, what about other industries or sectors that uh, that these differences might actually come into play? Well, I focus primarily on B two B, right? So the the B two C world, um, I would not be the expert to speak to that. But because I do product marketing generally, I have clients who are in hotel tech. I have clients who sell childcare software. I have clients who sell. ERP software. Um, and it's, I think it's almost as important, especially in my line of work, because I do work with a lot of startups and companies that are trying to get to an IPO and they're competing against incumbents. Um, one thing that I have noticed is you get a lot of people where an executive team comes in to become the management of some up and coming unicorn but they come from an entirely different sec sector. They don't understand what they need to know. They may come from IT and they're used, used to selling to IT folks and they think that it's gonna be this knockdown drag out and that they have to just come with hard data and support that. But then you know, all of a sudden they're selling to HR benefits managers who have an entirely different expectation. So the pricing, I think you find it all the same, but how you go about um, providing um, perspective on how to use it becomes very important depending on the buyer persona, the type of person they are. Some of them want to have that head to head. They want to see the, the vendor sort of fight it out. Other ones that's completely off-putting if you go in and those ones clearly you don't go in and say, well, we know so-and-so is more expensive than us, right? You have to sort of set subtle traps, ask questions, tell them to ask the other folks that they're uh, communicating with and considering um, X, Y, Z that'll, that'll allow you to gain some, uh, some ground on them. So to me, that's a lot of it. It's about how do you position the information you get depending on the, the uh, um, vertical and then and who your end buyer is. Right, depending on, on the go-to-market motion as well. Right. What about, um, Philippe, what about the rest of B2B tech? Because it's quite broad. Um, is there differences? Have you seen differences in, in yeah. your approach to go after hardware versus on-prem software versus SaaS? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting one. The So one of the more interesting things that seems to happen, and I, this is, I've been with Cascade for almost six years now. So like this has happened in different phases. Um, whenever there's a part of the B2B tech world that's really finally moving from on-prem to cloud, and that is still happening to those of you who think everything is in the cloud at this point, um, you, that, that's, it's kind of this interesting inflection point where you have these, especially like old guard legacy companies who are used to being able to charge one upfront fee that's massive and then getting, getting some sort of kickback to maintain it for a while. Um, they, they, there's an inflection point where they have to start figuring out cloud-based pricing, and that's where because this is unlike most SaaS, there is no, um, this is the cost per user that's publicly on a site. Um, that's where it gets super interesting. You see some companies doing some really weird pricing things because they haven't really figured out, they, they don't have the expertise or time spent figuring out how to price stuff. So I'd say one, one point that's super interesting in our space is the on-prem to cloud move. Um, yeah, I actually, I, a really quick anecdote that is related. I was super excited to be a part of this webinar, obviously, but like, like Vincent, it's been fun to set this up. And I was telling a client um, a couple weeks ago who, who we worked with for a while and she reached out and said like, hey, I'd like to do some pricing research. And I said, I have just the thing to talk to you about. And I get on with her and I, the first thing I say is like, oh, so I'm doing this webinar in two weeks. I'm gonna be talking about how like blah, blah, blah. And if pricing is all you care about, you are essentially just commoditizing yourself. You're essentially just saying it's coming just down to dollars and cents and that's all the difference there is. 
And my client looks at me in the webcam and says, but Philippe, we sell a commodity. And there, so there is some, even in B2B tech, there is some where it is just purely commodity based. But um, for the most part, I would point back to all the pricing model stuff, discounting, terms and conditions, things like that. That's a really fun, fun story. What about other industries so, such as like healthcare? April, I know that you're very familiar with that world. Yeah, I think, you know, a, a lot of the kind of key concepts translate across industries. Uh, one thing that you find in healthcare, you might find it in, um, you know, when you're trying to talk to kind of high level developers too in the tech space, um, is that these people can be difficult to reach. So that's, uh, you know, kind of thinking through how you can gain access to those people is, you know, maybe something that you bump into more often in healthcare. Um, and I think along those same lines, figuring out who cares about what in the decision making process. So you may have healthcare providers, you might have um, supply chain buyers, uh, you might have, um, we did a project for equipment that goes into an operating room. And so you have a doctor using the equipment, a nurse setting it up and somebody else paying for it. Um, so understanding from all of those different stakeholders, and that's one of the recommendations I'd make when the scenario sounds familiar to you, whether in healthcare or not, is who's involved in the decision and who has the heaviest influence and what does that role care about? So in that particular case, if I would have talked to only purchasing people, they all would have said price. Um, however, um, understanding from the doctors who are billing for surgeries in a surgical suite, um, downtime was the most important thing to them, or uptime, I guess, was the most important thing to them. Downtime was a bad thing. So they were willing to pay a price um, because if they were up and running, that meant more money for them. And so then understanding who had more influence in the decision, um, the doctor or the buyers. And so that's kind of a, a, a you know, simplified that example quite a lot for the sake of time. Um, but those are some of the things that we run into in healthcare. There's an insurance component sometimes in healthcare, depending on the product. So that can tie directly to price um, for both people, both the healthcare providers who are making recommendations and also to the end user, the consumer. Um, so whether or not things are covered by insurance and how insurance views those things, which is a, just a little difference in the healthcare space. And another one um, is probably tied to revenue stream. So something that we don't always think about is um, if someone brings a product and tries to sell it into the healthcare industry, is that additive to revenue stream or does it take away? So if I've come out with a new test that you do at home on a strip and you read the results yourself, you've just taken a whole bunch of revenue out of my lab, for example. So just being aware of those things in conjunction with price, I think is, um, is really important. And I'm giving you healthcare examples. I, I've seen, and I know you guys could cite how it's different in tech and maybe how it's different in manufacturing, but those are just, each is different, each vertical is different but some of the same principles apply. I still believe that primary research is, is a differentiator when gathering intelligence. I think some of the same uh, key intelligence questions are the critical launching off point to get the information that you need. I think some of the same tips and techniques work, but these are some of the you know, nuances that I've seen in healthcare specifically. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. Uh, we, we can probably go on for another hour or two, uh, but we're up at time already. So. There's one last question for the panel. Any examples when there's no pricing transparency and you simply couldn't get good info on pricing and you had to tell a client that you hit a wall in getting pricing info? Like what are, what are some of the tips and tricks in dealing with that particular situation? Uh, the best tip or trick, I'm guessing April and Brady will agree with me on this, but the best thing you can do to solve that situation is not get in it in the first place. So one of the things we really try to do is never scope something that's not feasible. We spend a lot of time at the front looking stuff up early so we can come back and say, this is exceedingly unlikely. Worst case scenario, if, like we, if, it's, if we have to structure something that is an all out effort where we're gonna try to get whatever we can, we just, we, we come up with like, if, not, if we can't get to this, then what else will be valuable to you? 
but that's exceedingly rare. We just don't want it. To, we don't want to take on work where we're not going to provide value and you're going to spend two months waiting on it. Yeah, I think it also points back to, is that your most important and valuable question? And so often that is, and, and that isn't just because we're trying to talk people out of doing that work because we don't want to do it. We honestly and sincerely believe that it will be more impactful to understand the bigger picture. And as part of that picture, we'll unearth whatever we can about specific pricing. Um, and so that's generally how our projects look. And, you know, thinking about those of you who have internal stakeholders, um, kind of communicate, you know, switching that expectation and then anything that you get on pricing is helpful, but everyone's so enamored with learning about what buyers really care about and how pricing should be, you know, included or not included in the conversation or how you should talk about pricing in the conversation is so much more valuable that no one gets stuck on, but you didn't get a price for product X in this market. Um, no one really gets stuck on that because the rest of it's so valuable. So I'm going to go back to restructuring key intelligence questions in a way that you're collecting that, which is the most meaningful and valuable to them. I would just add that sometimes you you think the things that are most intuitive are, are wrong, right? You think pricing is the first thing I need to know when you think about competition. And I need to know with granularity, it's intuitive, it feels right. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of years of experience on this panel that can tell you that it's great to have. It's, uh, it's important to, to get a good understanding of those things, but, um, but it's not something that uh, in my experience has made or, or broken the ability to, uh, to win in a market. Excellent points around. Uh, thank you for all, for all your insights or experiences and stories that are shared here. Um, for everyone else that are still on the webinar, we'll definitely be sharing this webinar recording shortly afterwards, sometime around today. Um, but with that, I am going to say thank you. And oh, I can't even find the other slide, but thank you. And uh, we will be here to answer any questions. If any follow-up questions for the panel, for myself, uh, feel free to send an email back to for to us and we'll get that responded back in our follow-up. Take care all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.